Hey, this is Steve Rissman, the uh, program chair for the Workers' Compensation Educational Conference, which this year is August 23rd to August 26th, and as always, at the Orlando World Marriott Center. It is the largest gathering of workers' compensation professionals in the country, drawing some seven to 8,000 people, way larger than, uh, than the other even large workers' compensation conventions. Uh, the program is substantive and is almost 150 pages in length, we have well over 300 speakers, and we have well over 200 actual sessions. So if you're involved in workers' compensation, uh, you ought to be there. It's for, uh, it's for every conceivable interest group that is involved in workers' compensation. Let me give you a couple of uh, highlights uh, for the convention. Uh, we have um, always entertainment on Monday night, big name entertainment, and this year is absolutely no exception. We have Joan Jett as our Monday Night Entertainment. She should be just fabulous. And we also have a keynote speaker on Monday, continuing in our um, in the vein of professional football players. This year, we have Herschel Walker, famed running back for, uh, for Dallas, Minnesota, and of course, Georgia. And from a personal standpoint, my absolute favorite college football player. Uh, one of the best attended programs each year at the convention is the live surgery. And, and I can tell you that uh, there is no other convention in the country where uh, adjusters, lawyers, nurse case managers, other workers' compensation professionals can go and actually see live surgery performed. It's like, it's like at the beginning of Saturday Night Live, live from New York at Saturday night, where we're live from the Marriott, it's, it's the live surgery. And uh, since we started the live surgery program, it has always been, um, it has always been uh, performed by doctors at Orlando Orthopedic Center. And that's uh, exactly what we're going to do today. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Brad Burkert, who is, um, who is a uh, orthopedic specialist at Orlando Orthopedic Center. Doctor? Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, professional background? Sure. So I, uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I have an uh, added board specialty in sports medicine. So I take care of essentially everything. I don't do back surgery, but I'll see people with back pain. But we basically take care of anything from the shoulder to the knee. Uh, trained at University of Maryland Medical School. I went to residency here in Orlando and a fellowship in Cincinnati and I've practiced uh, both in North Carolina and then luckily I got to come back to Orlando and, and, and this is where I am to stay. Well good. What are you, uh, you going to be doing for us at the convention? In August? So we'll be doing a rotator cuff repair and uh, a rotator cuff repair is a very necessary procedure and it's something that uh, comes up often, in, especially in workers' compensation, but just in general. And the rotator cuff is really a, just a, a group of muscles, uh, it's four muscles that wrap around the humeral head in your shoulder. And if the rotator cuff is torn, that tendon will not heal and it, it needs surgery in order to make the tendon heal back down to the bone. So um, this is one of the um, more invasive type procedures as far as how long it takes to recover. Okay, it takes a good four to six months sometimes to recover from these types of things. And again, it is a common procedure uh, that we do in workers' compensation and in, and in non-workers' compensation patients as well. That's exactly what um, our audience will want to hear about, the healing time, and you said four to six months, and tell us about that recovery period. How long uh, is it that the injured employee typically can't work at all and then when can he go back to light duty work and what sort of restrictions will he have when he goes back? Right. So the surgery itself only takes about an hour to perform. So my part's easy. I get to do an hour of surgery and uh, usually get to uh, get people fixed and then the recovery is what takes a long time and it's it's hard for the patient, it's hard for the employer. It does take quite a quite a long time to fully recover from a rotator cuff repair. So again the surgery takes about an hour okay and then once that surgery is performed patients are generally completely out of work for at least a week maybe 10 days. Um, they're in a sling for six weeks and that sling stays on all the time unless they're doing their therapy or taking their shower or those types of things and they'll be doing physical therapy. I start physical therapy right away within the first couple of days after a surgery. Mm -hmm. And that's, that therapy will continue for three or four months. But in that first six weeks, they'll be on light duty after we see them the first time. So out of work for about 10 days or so, then light duty, which will say no use of the arm at all. So if they're in a job that requires two arms, they're probably gonna still be out of work. Yeah, so if, if they have an office job, they can, they can return exactly. after a couple of weeks. Right. 
if they don't, then they're they're really temporarily and totally disabled for up to what six weeks? Uh, yeah, probably up to six weeks for sure, and then even up to twelve weeks, depending on if they have a high labor job, like a brick mason, for, for instance, wouldn't be able to go back with one arm. But uh, say, like you were saying, a, a supervisor or a manager, somebody who's just going around and talking to people, telling them what to do, those people can go back a little bit sooner. And then, how about in that two to four month period of time, if they're on light duty? Have the restrictions changed during them? They're out of the sling. Right, so around six weeks, I'll usually lift some of the restrictions and say, okay, instead of absolutely no use, then you know, this person can type, this person can write, this person can carry a notepad, those types of things um, for, and so you get to the three month mark. And at that point, we'll allow a little bit more use, but until three months comes around, people still can't really do much lifting with the arm. And for a full recovery, uh, after a rotator cuff tear, and again, depending on the size, it's about four and a half to six months. I would say, in general, for workers' compensation, it's about six months before I release them full duty um, and at MMI. Okay, so in that four and a half to six months, the early ones will reach maximum medical improvement, and by the end of six months, virtually all of them have reached maximum medical improvement. Correct. And how about uh, impairment ratings? What's typical for a rotator so cuff? So a typical impairment rating for a rotator cuff is somewhere from about 3 to 5% or so. Um, sometimes it's higher because rotator cuffs can be small, they can be medium, they can be large, they can be massive. And depending on the age of the patient, the size of the tear, how well they recover, other uh, factors, uh, they, you know, some people are younger and they have smaller tears, they recover quicker. And the older people with larger tears, they recover slower. And uh, so generally, yeah, you get to the six month mark and the majority of people are at maximum medical improvement at that time. Sometimes people have restrictions. You know, if you have a 75 year old um, hospital worker who has a giant rotator cuff tear, sometimes there'll be a permanent restriction as to overhead lifting. But uh, of course the goal is always to get people back to full duty with no restrictions. That doesn't always happen. Well, let's not go 75 or the 30 year old mm -hmm. athlete. Let's talk about sort of the average guy or girl. Mm -hmm. And after they've reached maximum medical improvement and you've given them the rating of three to five or six percent, mm -hmm. uh, what, what sort of restrictions would be just sort of general or typical in that event? So general, so assuming, let's assume that the patient has done wonderfully and their strength is five out of five, and meaning that they have full strength and they have full motion, then I would tell that person, you can go back to doing anything you want. You want to play sports, go play sports. You want to go back to work, go back to work. Do, do anything that you want to do. But uh, some people who have any type of persistent weakness, uh, those types of things, a typical restriction would say maybe no overhead lifting or no um, continuous overhead work. Hmm. So like installing mufflers wouldn't be the best job perhaps. Now, I, I started this out by talking about how unusual it was for uh, lawyers and, and adjusters and nurse case managers to see live surgery like this. Is it, do you think it's beneficial for them to see what's actually going on with the really injured do. workers in the surgery? Yeah, I really do. I think it's, I think it's a wonderful uh, opportunity. I think it's a wonderful program. The, um, the benefit of seeing a procedure is, I, I don't think can be really expressed. Um, it's just like, you know, a picture says a thousand words. Well, in this case, a live surgery says a million words. Just seeing the actual procedure, seeing how the rotator cuff is torn, seeing exactly what we're doing in order to get it reduced, and even just the little details of, hey, look at this tendon, this one is more torn than you would expect, or this is nice thick tendon, and this is good bone, this isn't good bone. All the things that, as orthopedic surgeons, we can speak to each other and, and have a very good understanding of it. Sometimes people who have never even seen the procedure can't uh, quite wrap their minds around it, but I think doing this, kind of puts things into perspective a little bit and gives everybody a, a different understanding. Okay, that's good. So now we know why it's good for adjusters and lawyers and nurses and nurse case managers to see the surgery. How about looking at it from an exactly opposite direction? Is it good for, um, for you as an orthopedic surgeon or doctors generally to come to a convention like this and, and get to get to hang with, get to meet, get to talk to uh, the, the uh, participants in the convention? I think it's a I think it's a really unique opportunity for especially for orthopedic surgeons for for doctors in general. Um, you know, specifically for me, this is a way for me to get to interact with all of the different facets of a typical workers' compensation claim, from the attorneys to the adjusters to the nurse case managers, 
and sort of everybody in between. I think it's very helpful, uh, particularly for, for me and probably for many orthopedic surgeons, to just try to understand, you know, what uh, are the questions that each of those people who are involved in a workers' compensation claim have, say the adjusters or the nurse case managers and the, uh, all the different medical staff, the employers. Um, it's, it, it helps us gain a bigger perspective as opposed to just the surgical part and just the medical part and kind of understand the full picture. Appreciate it, Doctor. Thanks. Thank you. I'm here with uh, Dr. Lawrence Halpern from Orlando Orthopedic Center and he is one of the two doctors doing our live surgery presentation. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. How are you? Good. Tell us a little bit about uh, your professional career. I, uh, I grew up in New York City and I went to medical school at the State University of New York in Brooklyn, New York. And then I did my residency in Brooklyn at the Kings County Hospital Center and State University. And I did a hand surgery fellowship uh, after that in Syracuse, New York at the, uh, the medical school in Syracuse, New York. I've been in practice at Orlando Orthopedic Center doing mostly hand and arm surgery since 1990. Uh, been chair of hospital uh, the orthopedic departments. I serve on the board of directors of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and I take care of quite a few patients. This year at the Work Comp Convention, I'm going to be performing a decrovanes release. Decrovanes is an operation in which we take the pressure off a couple of inflamed tendons in the wrist. So first, I want to explain a little bit about the anatomy. These white lines going into the hand are tendons. I'd like you to think of a tendon like a rope. The red muscle pulls the tendon, and then the tendons pull the bone, and that's how. That's how all our fingers move, that's how our thumbs move, and our wrist moves. If you look at the back of your hand, you'll see, what many people will see a line right like that. That straight line is actually a tendon pulling the finger straight. In decor veins, we have these two tendons heading towards the thumb, going under this structure. This picture makes it look like two tendons going under something, but in actuality, they're two tendons going through a very tight tunnel. And once those tendons get inflamed, it can be problematic trying to get that inflammation to go away. So the first step in trying to get that inflammation to go away is anti-inflammatory medication and a steroid injection into the tunnel. Steroids are a very potent medication to diminish inflammation. If the pain persists, it's a relatively small operation to open the tunnel and take the pressure off the tendons. There are a couple things we have to look out for when we do that operation. There are some small nerves sitting right on top of the tunnel, which we have to be careful of and move out of the way. And actually, sometimes it's two tunnels, not one. So we have to be very careful to look and make sure all the tendons are released. Now, this is uh, a workers' compensation convention, so the question is, when does work cause the decor veins? Decor veins can happen for no good reason. De decor veins happens to some people who don't get injured and don't work repetitively. However, Heavy repetitive work in which these tendons move back and forth many hours a day, day after day, can lead to inflammation in those tendons. And sometimes trauma can cause inflammation in those tendons. People who fall or twist their arm uh, uh, at work can get a case of decrovanes tenosynovitis. It's very common. It's probably the second most common operation I do, um, and it frequently is secondary to a work injury. Doctor, when is this uh, surgery necessary? Is it always something that's work related? Uh, two different questions. It, it's necessary uh, if you don't make a person better, the steroid injection and medication and the pain continues to be severe enough that it, it's bothersome, debilitating, and it makes life difficult. It's not always work-related. Uh, in fact, it can happen uh, idiopathically, meaning sometimes it happens for no good reason. It is very common in people who do repetitive work all day long because when you're repetitively working, cake decorators, heavy typists, meaning people who type all day long, those tendons just keep moving back and forth. And it also happens traumatically. Uh, a twisting injury, a fall, anything that can put a significant amount of pressure on the wrist can get those tendons inflamed. Most of our audience, doctor, are adjusters or nurse case managers or maybe even some lawyers. And they're going to want to know what the recovery time is for a surgery like this. How much time does the injured worker have to be off work completely? Can he go back to light duty? When he goes to light duty, what sort of restrictions? I usually keep people off work till the, sta uh, till the stitches come out, which is about 10 days. And at that point, I make them eligible for light duty. Uh, if, if the initial, uh, uh, when the stitches first come out and the light duty is no lifting over five pounds, nothing heavily repetitive. 
As far as when they can go back to regular duty, in a large part it depends on what their regular job is. A construction worker is going to take longer to get back to heavy work than uh, uh, someone who's a security guard who's just walking back and forth and happened to fall down and hurt their wrist. Most people uh, with this operation are back to regular duty by two or three months. Um, it's uncommon for it to go longer than that. Certainly uh, there's a range. Not everybody gets better at the exact same speed, but most people are doing fairly well by three months. and. Um, most people don't have an impairment rating after the surgery. Uh, you usually don't lose motion. You usually uh, don't lose strength. Uh, it's a fairly small and uh, fairly frequently successful operation. Let's let's circle back just a little bit then. So they're off work completely for only a couple of weeks. Then depending on the type of uh, job they have, they'll have light duty for maybe up to six weeks or maybe even two months. That's about right. And then they will have reached a plateau of maximum medical improvement? Somewhere around three months after surgery, most people are there. Okay, and then depending on how well they do from the surgery, they'll either have a very small impairment or no impairment at all. It is uncommon for the impairment rating for the surgery to go over 2%. Okay, and then um, will there be some who have actual permanent restrictions from, from this surgical procedure? When you say some, the answer is occasionally, but that's very uncommon. So most, most often, this surgery, when successful, uh, the patient is able to go back to work doing full duty with essentially no restrictions. That is correct. Doctor, do you think it benefits um, uh, the audience, the people who are non-medical professionals? We have lawyers again and, and adjusters and nurse case managers. Do you think it benefits them to actually see a procedure like this, a live surgery? Oh, I think it absolutely does. Um, you know, these are people, they're, they're, they're not just someone who got hurt at work. These are people who go through things. They're not always easy. Surgery, even a small surgery, is, is scary to people. Um, it, it's very important for people who are making decisions about other individuals to understand what they're going through. I think it gives a lot of insight into what's happening. Good. And then the, 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 the next question is sort of the opposite of that. You know, here we have a convention, and there are a lot of doctors who attend it, but it's not a convention for doctors specifically. Uh, do you think a convention like this benefits you or your company or doctors in general to uh, be able to talk with uh, people who are not in your profession? In other words, for you to spend um, 15 minutes or a half an hour or an hour talking to adjusters or lawyers, nurse case managers about workers' compensation generally and what they do for a living and what you do for a living? I think there's two parts to that. First is anytime you talk to people and get to know them and get to understand what they're doing, it makes it easier to communicate, it makes it easier to understand where their questions are coming from. Uh, but more importantly, until I started going to this convention, I didn't understand what workers' compensation was all about. While, while we docs have a really important part of, of the pie and taking care of the patients is very important, we didn't realize, or I didn't realize, that there's a lot more to it than just what goes on in my office. The system is much broader than that. And to, uh, to help the people, help your patients get through the system, you really have to understand what goes on. And what goes on in a workers' compensation case and what goes on in the world of work, workers' compensation goes way beyond what goes on in my office. You know, in fact, we were talking about that right before we started um, with, this, uh, with this interview. The uh, convention program's some 150 pages long. And it's like the um, it's like the tail of the elephant. It depends on what part you're feeling to know where you are. Usually, people are interested in six, seven, eight pages of the convention brochure, and they aren't interested in the others. The lawyers may be interested in the medical part of it or the lawyer part of it, but they aren't interested in the industry part of it. And the people who want to learn about chiropractic or pain medicine want to learn about that, but they don't care about national trends. And the convention offers a lot of things to a lot of people, and I'm glad you brought that up. At one of the conventions, I heard a medical director of a workers' compensation carrier talking, and I understood a lot better how his decisions were made. Doesn't mean I agreed with him, but I understood where they were coming from. No, and in fact, that's that's sort of critical for your education. Uh, you know, you consider yourself independent and your judgment independent, but if you don't know what the pay the payers are looking for then you might be missing the boat on that part of your understanding. And we're asked questions often that have uh, nothing to do necessarily with the medicine. Uh, could this be, have been caused by something else? And um, could it be caused by something other than work? And understand, you don't understand where people are coming from until you understand how the system works.